Okay, so uh, we're back from lunch, and uh, it's good to still see people here <laughs> for the uh, last keynote. So our last keynote of this day is um, Muli from uh, Baidu, and the second chair for this keynote is uh, Harold Liu from Beijing Institute of Technology. So I'm going to pass over to Harold to chair the session. Thank you. All right. Uh, very, very good afternoon. Um, so uh, please allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Mo Li. I have his bio uh, in my book. So Mo Li is a senior architect of uh, Institute of Deep Learning at Baidu. His research institute lies in machine learning and distributed systems. He built a core machine learning system for Baidu's online computational advertising, which scales hundreds of billions of samples and parameters. He also has his PhD candidate at CSD of CMU. Working with uh, Alex Smoller and Dave Anderson, he got his master and bachelor degrees from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So, Dr. Lee's um, uh, keynote title is uh, Scaling Distributed Machine Learning with uh, Parameter uh, Server. So, let, let us welcome. Thank you. So, Companies only get money 
statement only if the user has been clicked this, this tag. On this case, the display position is the most important resources because you cannot get the whole page as all of the content. So you only have, for example, four position to display the ads, and the rest it should be the substantial job. Otherwise, it's the user experience is very is hard. So from here, here's the nature of the position bias. So the user, maybe most of the user look at the first time. If he get the things he wants to click and do not view the lesser things. So this is the most important position. This is the second important position. So in this case, in this case, the ad is ranked by how the probability the user wants to click this ad times the bid price so the user wants to pay if this if this ad has been clicked. So we the so the user the search engine ranks the ad by the probability times the price. Here's two terms here. The first term is no, in fact, because it's it's not controlled by us. It's controlled it's it's a price by the users. So what we can do is that given the ad, given the user to view this ad and given the search information, we want to predict whether or not this a lot or no. Sorry, this user wants to click it. We call it predict the click through rate. So we use a machine learning approach because a lot of the uh, ad has not been shown enough times because we have about millions of new ads each day. This is not this is not only some new advertisers from each day and also because the these advertisers want to modify these ads from day to day, so we change a lot of the new things and we do not have this place too much, so we need to know what is the click probability of this event. So from the machine learning approach, what we do is that we first generate a feature vector. So given the ads, given the user, given the scene, and then we generate a, a feature vector and also we collect whether or not this user has been clicked and we get the label. Next, we want to model the click probability. That is, we use a very simple logistic, simple way that you have the vector here, the feature vector, you have a you have a weight, what we want to learn, and this is the label. And this maps the positive, positive number and this maps the things to a number between zero and one. Any number between zero and one we can view as probability. Yeah, this is what we measure here to say. And we model the thing. Next we want to solve the weight, the model. So if we if we just minimize the left if not the likely good, so we get a famous logistic regression model. Before we go how to learn this model, we first view how to generate the feature, the feature. So feature engineer is the most effective way to improve the model performance. And even you may say, okay, but only we can learn the feature automatically, but if we have a good feature, it's still here to help the difference a lot. So and feature engineer engineer is a scalable way to as a system because you can hire a lot of people. For example, our group we have about 50 people to look at the, the query, to look at the log, to see to think, okay, what the feature I should generate? And what is the information on that log? So if he did that, he generated a new feature, add to the system, and to check whether the system performance has been improved. We have spent I think five years and the 50 people to do that things. That is a very long work. And I can go to the detail about how we generate the feature, but we measure there's three major resources. First of all is the ad itself. You can it's a short document. You can generate underground features and a lot of text features. And next is the user. So which user you view the ad? So it's personalization. Some user may be prefer different things. And also which app is comes from the advertisers. So there's a match between user and advertisers. Also there's a, a lot of session session information. And 
given which session the user behaves very differently. So, if we generate a feature, what about the data size? That is, each query, each app is a, is a example. So, here's a big from Google. The, there's two parts. The, I think the, the left part is the app Google display at the along the website. And the right side is the Google display app on its own search page. So, as you can see, there's about five billion of corrects each day. Each correct generates uh, examples. So that is, you collect about five billion of examples every day. And I think for Google, yeah, each day, I think for Google, you have about uh, five billion US dollars each day. For my list, the, the number is the, the same. So, if we, if we use one year search mark, we get two trillions of trillions of examples. One question is that okay, we can do some sampling because we have so many examples. Why not we sample something? But this is not always a good idea because the personalization, the long tail. If we sample, we lost the tail. The head, the head is here here. But you, you sample the tail, and because a lot of users only have a few examples, if we sample the things. Yeah, we lose the, lose the users. So, if we do the personalization, sampling is not usually a good idea. So, what we do is that we put all this data into the machine learning system. And what about the feature size? It's a very fast feature. So, it consists of number of concurrence we have. In fact, we use the ND larger than 10 on our case. And how many users you have. And also the session information. How many stations do you have? And last of all, the compilation, because this is a linear model. And for some cases, kernel machines get a good performance. For example, polynomial kernel get a good performance. But we only want to run the linear model. What we can do is that you have two different kinds of features. You can do times, cross times, to generate a large feature group. And you can, that is, you can compile this. Uh, combine some features and we generate a lot of features here. So yeah, if you have if you have a lot of people who work on these things, and if you find it, we have found that the number of features is similar to the at the scale of the number of examples. But here's a training log we run a few years ago. It's uh, it's a somewhere in September, a few years ago, and this kind of task we run each day. And we have a, about 100 billion of examples and about 6 billion of features. So, this is the one, it's a type of the type of task that we run for the advertising. So, this is just the one example. What about the typical industrial data set size? I think a reasonable assumption is that you have about 100 billion of examples because you have a billion of users, each user may generate some data. And if you do feature engineer good, good, and you have about 10 billion of features. Given this data set, you have a one terabyte to one terabyte of training data. Here's the big from Google. It's five years ago. There's four productions. Each production has a okay, 60 billion, 100 billion. These are examples. And the raw data, compressed, not compressed. And you have how many features, for example. So this is five years ago. That, that size gen increased a lot. And even for some small companies, as I know, back to China this, this summer, we, I talked to a lot of guys from the startup companies. Yeah, that. For example, the mobile app companies, you also have such scale problems. So I think this is a reasonable assumption for the industrial data set. Given that you have so many data, what you can do is that, okay, I want to learn a large model because there's a rich, there's a lot of information from this data. So I want to learn a large model so can model better. So if you learn linear binary classification, you have two billion of features, you can generate a model have 10 billion of waveform here, and this is about 18 gigabytes of the data. This 
size goes to much bigger if they use multi class program. This is number of features times number of class you have. And if you run top model, number of words times number of products. And this goes to much larger for the deep learning. Yeah. For the deep learning, we run it. It's quite easy to generate the model larger than 100 gigabyte. On this case, single machine is too slow at the test. Yeah, you can run it. You store on the disk each time you run stochastic readiness and then read the data from time to time. But it's too slow because we need a model to serve in some online productions. We care about the real time, we care about the details. So what we can do is, here is one solution. Yeah, you can distribute the workload. You can let multiple machines to run the sense. That is, the model is shared by multiple machines, the data is shared by multiple machines, and we run some distributed algorithm to get sense. What is the current state of distributed system? There's a lot of open source things. How do we? Yeah, some years ago it's very popular, but now we know that it's not good for some iterative algorithms such as functional. Spark is a memory habit. It's much faster than Hadoop, but yeah, you, if you have 100 gigabyte of data, it's perfectly fine. But if the data goes to large density storage, or yeah, Spark is great. So, and API yeah, mm, is developed by HPC guys. It's fast. But not so easy for programming and not so easy for the fault tolerance. And grab that is a fault graph, VW is a linear thing. And most of this is not really scalable to the industrial data set, given that you have one hectare of data, 1,000 one of machines. This is not the option you have. And what we want to talk today is that we want to just introduce a, it's a distributed system. It's developed by, by you, by CMU, by Google. And this is the large scale, that's the largest experiment we run on different systems. So this is from Microsoft, this is from Spark, GraphLab, VW, and also the same. Now yeah, it's from Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google. So here's the number of CPU calls you use. This is the size of the model you have. The largest one. I want to show today that we run a little more regrets a lot distribution. We use a, about six billion, 60 billion e examples. Yeah, oh, sorry, six billion features and about 600 terabytes of data using 100 machines. So we can just run start from scratch and it can be finished within one hour. Also, we want to show how to run even large scale plugin model. Here's a structure this is this talk. We first introduce some background. We want to discuss the details about the system, it's how we make things efficient, how we make fault tolerance, how we make the user using the programming, and we show some algorithms fit to this system, and we show some experiments. From my point of view, on the large scale machine learning, it's a co-design of system algorithms. You cannot, you first you should be look at the algorithms and abstraction the interface to make some abstraction of the workload. Design the system and also you need to modify the algorithms to fit on the system. So I'm going to show how to do that thing at the same time. <coughs> so we first consider a very simple problem. Given the data set, each row is a is an example, each each column is a feature, and we want to learn a value. A value. For example, it's a linear model. Yeah, that is it's a value here. What we can do with that? Because the data is so large, the model is so large, what we can do is that we can distribute the work, the data onto several machines, and also we can distribute the model onto several machines. So on this, on this view, this is type client or server viewpoint. The model goes to the server node, server machines, the data goes to the worker machines. And you can do some communication. For example, the, some worker gets some data. We want to tell the, data, tell the readout to the server or get the new readout from the server. The server also can broadcast the readout it has to the other worker node. This is, in, in fact, the vertical communication. Um, next, I'm going to show how we run a simple gradient descent here. That is, we first assume we have the data, 
located on some, for example, HDFS or some net, uh, network file system. And we assume that model has been already on the server. This is, I only show one, yeah, it's the multiple servers, multiple machines to get that model. The first step is that you get some worker machines. Each worker machine read a part of the training data. It's a part of the examples you have. The next step, you get model from. You just get the model from the server node. So if you do that, now we can do iteration. That is, for each time, you first each work machines using its own data, its own model, to compute the gradient path. This is the red, red box. The next, because this is local gradient, you want to get a global gradient. So that is the gradient over all examples you have. What you can do is that the worker can the send the data from the server. The server connect all this local gradient from all the things you send the submission. So the server aggregated gradient. Next, you, you get the gradient, you cannot say the model. You just uh, start to minus the new rate times the gradient. So you can update the model. So finally, you tell the office worker, okay, here's the new model you have. Just to get it, and then you can start the last iteration. So this is a very simple how to way to distribute the gradient descent. Next, we want to show okay, this. This is the, just a basic idea. Of this we need to do a lot of optimization to make it scale scalable to a lot a large data set. The first question is that because the model is because you have a so large model, how each work machine can get can get the model you have. Because, because the local memory is limited. You can maybe you cannot store all this model here. Okay, here's the trick. Because if you have a real lot of features, what you can do is that it's a sparse data. You cannot get the dense data if you have billions of features. So definitely you have sparse data. So here's the example. This is the part of data you get from worker. So you get new you get a few rows, and because you only get a few rows, there's a lot of columns you do not have value. If you do not need the non-zero value for this column, you don't need to store the model, this model here. So you, what, you, what you only just have is that the non-zero features you have. So this is the working set of this worker. And here's an experiment. The x-axis, how many workers you have, the y-axis is the percent of the model you should maintain. If you only have one worker, definitely you need to keep the whole model. But if you run 100 workers, well, that is 100 machines, each machine only needs to maintain 7.8% of the model on its memory, in its memory. And if you go to this number to 10,000 workers, yeah, this number goes down to less than uh, 0, 0.1%. Percent. So even that you have a very large model, and if you partition the result, partition the data onto different machines, each machine only needs a part of that. And and this huge model is maintained by a group of server nodes. So this is no problem for the same system memory. So the next thing is how to make the thing fast. Here's the very famous slide function thing. That is, the, the world is not flat. It's a, a hierarchical system. So, this is L1 cache. It's very, very fast. But if you want to fetch the L2 cache, and if you have branch prediction, so it's 10 times slower. And if you want to get data from memories, it's another 10 times slower. And if you want to, okay, this is from the disk. And the most important thing is from, if we want to read the things from the network because the distributed computing in here to communicate data. So like 1,000 times slower than read the things from the memory or read the things from the cache. So this is the only thing, this is the thing, most important thing and we want to know for the rest of this size. So that is standard thing on the network, it's very expensive. So keep this in mind, so what we can do is that we need to make the communication interface not value by value. We want to back 
match the communication. That is, you cannot send a double float or float, a single float over the network because you need to pay the cost. This is, this is a TCP IP head and this is a non protocol head. And the, so the actual workload we have is small. And if you send the same, so the network, there's a few delay. Well, you can do that, you can batch a lot of things. For example, each time you send one megabyte of data, the data overhead is not so large. So it's, you can fully use the network bandwidth. So the interface, what we designed that, so we can, because, okay, because the model is by, sorted by, uh, stored by key value pairs, that is, keys, the feature ID you have, the identity of the feature, the values, the, the weight of the model here. So the model is a like, key value system. And the difference is the type of key value system, we batch the communications. That is, we use a range based cushion code. Here's the example. Given that you have six features here, one to six, and you have two servers, each server maintains half of the features you have. And this is a worker. This worker cache four grab four weight of this model. And what you want to do that? You can say, okay, I want to push all this value from the key range three and five onto the server. So so that you do not have this value, and this only two guys go to the server. And you can change the range, okay, to a very large range, you push all this model onto the server, okay, you can also reduce the range you only percent the one particular thing. And in most of the cases, do not stand a particular thing. It's not desirable. <laughs> Next, you can get the value from, from the server. That is, and we have a server. Get the values from between feature rank 3 and 5 to me. What the server did, okay? Because you only have three, two point here, I only send them if they want to. Okay, this is the communication API, it's quite simple, but it's range based because for most of the time the machine network only want to send the range of the system. The next, because you have two kinds of resources for a computer. One the CPU, one the network. If you do some computation, the network is idle. And if you want to set something and keep the CPU idle, so so you just waste the half of the resources. What you want to do that, you want to parallelize the use of both CPU and the network. So that is, we want to synchronize the process. We make the obstruction here. That is, we obstruct all this workload as a task. It can be a push, it can be a pull, or some any user defined function. That is, running all these iterations is a task. And in fact, it's an RPC call. It's a we involve with several machines. And yeah, you can, and in each iteration, you can do a lot of push and pull. And the most important thing that is, it is asynchronous. We take the example here. So here's the here's the iteration we showed on the previous gradient descent. What happens is that you first the computer gradient use some CPUs or GPUs, you know, and you send you push the gradient to the server, and then you pull the model from it from the server. So here you use the CPU for GPUs. Here you use the network. So you don't you want to parallelize the, the two things. What the nature thing you can do that for the next iteration, you do not wait the value back from the server. You just start it. You just start you computer gradients. Maybe use some old model. So this this is there's some data inconsistency. So in this case, you can keep the CPU busy and you can keep the network busy. But this is not, not usually a good idea because you know the integrations 11 use some old values. There's a data inconsistency. So if we want to guarantee the, the algorithms right, you can make the dependency here. What you can see that okay, I want the iteration to fail with the previous iteration to be finished even at the cost that I need to wait. The, the CPU is wasted of this, this time slot. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, this dependency can use to implement the, some, some work logic. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is that 
this dependency can be just a powerful tools to express the data consistency in the world. So I give three examples here. So each one is an iteration. So this iteration zero, one, two. And for sequential model, that is the strongest iteration you have. That is what you want to implement a single single thread method. That is, you finish iteration zero, finish next equals the iteration one, next equals iteration two. So that is everyone should wait the previous one to finish. This is a sequential consistency. The next, if you if you know the Yahoo well, yeah, LDA eventually, that is, each worker, each machine, try your best to get the things done, but I do not guarantee everything. So you can stop all this workload together. And who who runs faster, finish fast. So this is very system friendly because there's no way to know no secure, but you cannot guarantee you do not guarantee anything. The eventually means if we stop communication, eventually all this data will be considered. But this is too too, re, too relaxed for some machine algorithms. And the next is the trade-off between this strongest and the uh, not strongest. So that is we are now some data inconsistency, but we'll make sure we we'll make sure that they are not too different. That is iteration two can be start at the same time as iteration one, but you need to finish the the task one one time cycle. That is one bump in the delay, and yet you can change this value from zero, you get the sequential consistency. If you get except you finish, you get the this model. So this is a trade-off between this is a primary you can tune for this consistent model. Okay. And this is how this is about the data consistency between different tasks. The next you can give more things about the data within the task. For example, for each iteration, maybe you want to send some key value tags, but you can select tips of communication. So you just you only select some key value to be sent at the next time, maybe waiting for the next time. But here's a lot of examples. First one, we only set the values have been changed significantly over the last iteration. That is the value may be changed more than there only zero 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 one send it. Otherwise I do not send it. Next, the random skip filter. We randomly drop a lot of parameters to send. This is drop out for the different is a trick. And next is that it's more interesting that we can look at the, the optimal conditions. If I know this weight cannot change, I do not need to send it. I will show how to have this KDD filter. The reactivation. And yes, in, in order to reduce the communications, we have a lot of other optimizations. So here's the key catch. Because for a lot of optimization algorithms, the key list sent by different iterations do not change. Here's an example. For the time, time one, we set the key for a two, four, eight with different values. But the next time, maybe you send the same again. You send the same keys again, but the values change. On this, in this case, you don't need to send the key list again because if at the previous iteration you let the sender and the receiver catch the keys, so the next time you just send the signature of this key list. The test is back. Okay, I have been sent that thing to you before. So just use the if you still have that value, just use it. So I don't need to send it again to reduce half of the communication. The next thing that if you, for the machine has this there's a lot of zeros in the value. And if we do if you have that you just run a compression algorithm. So this is very good at compress the zero values. But this is a some some about the efficiency. I will skip the what the CD people for for us and move to the ne next how to use it. Because it's quite a, it's quite from the system viewpoint because for machine learning, for the data mining, all the things are mass projects. Of, of mass objects. So we make 
decision here. We present all the shared things as a sparse vector or sparse matrix. That is, the model is a vector, the model may be observed. It's a matrix. So we implement a lot of linear algebra operations so that the shared parameter can do some math times and divided by the local the local chain data is also mass objects. And we can be yeah, as so that you can write the program that they have met up and it's multi threaded so you don't need to worry about the local optimization. And also you can support some very nice C plus plus library. So here's the example. How you implement the logic logistic loss that is implement two two functions. One that how do you value this? So even assume you have this is the training data, the model, the label. Okay, you from this things. And how do you evaluate the grade? How do you evaluate the diagonal case and grade? Okay, so then I just write. Okay, this is what you write for the meta. So if you write this things, the system here keep present all the shared object as some local mass object, and you can guess as well. What you want to implement the, the previous grading descent we discussed earlier. What you can do is that it's very simple to function. First, you have to compute the gradient. That is, a loss can be the gradient. And how to update it? That is, the weight is minus by the linear rate times the gradient gathering. So this runs on the server, this runs on the workers. Next, I'm going to show how to implement a fast optimization algorithms of this system. So the object function you can see about is a very general object function. It's a fw plus hw. F is a loss. H is a driver. F is differentiable but not, not, not convex. For example, for the, some deep linear object is, is not differentiable but it's not convex. H is convex but maybe not smooth. For example, if you want an L1 driver, you want to sparse model, it's not, it's not smooth. And because for, for the app application, all the data is fast. For, for the spot data, different features have different weight because there's a parallel distribution. You have some features have a lot of non zero features, but you have a lot of features to not have to not have a lot of data here. So in this in this data set, all the descent runs very runs perfectly. So it's a very simple algorithm. Each time you choose one feature and update the weight of this feature. So this is where the value is very simple. That is from time to one, two, three, four. Each time you pick up a feature randomly and minimize this object function by fix all these other features. So this is a one dimensional problem. And you can solve by maybe you have a close form solution. If not, maybe you can run some expensive algorithm such as user method. This is the better algorithm you can have. And this runs perfectly for some text data and some very sparse data. But this is not a good idea because it's not it's a sequential algorithm. It's really hard to be multi-thread or be distributed algorithm. So what you can do is that okay, update one feature is expensive, but we can update the block of features rather than just the one. That is, each time, instead of rather than one three, one columns, we pick up a block of columns and compute the gradient of over of, over this column block of columns. Update the weight of this model. The next time you move to the next block. The next time you move to the next block. I think this is the accurate. So this is good because. You want to show next. This algorithm is really good if you have some data inconsistency. So here's the example. So if we run it asynchronously, what you can do is that we first update computer gradient or block zero. Send the gradient, put the weight. Next time you start with block one without waiting the, the value to come back. That is, you have some data you plot. Not consistent. But the good thing that rather than the gradient 
it is that each time, each delay, you make all of this weight maybe inconsistent. On this time, only block off weight is not okay. The rest of the things is okay. And if this block is not very correlated with the kind of block I uh, have yeah, it's totally fine. So if you choose two blocks, do not correlate. So parallelize this thing, blocks at the same time, do not affect it.
five in the morning so we can leave the update to some of the services. And then training data is have about one kind of written of examples. And you have a similar scale of features. This is about 60 billion features. And the raw text design is about 600 terabytes. And on these things, we run 1,000 machines. This is using about 60% uh, 16,000 of cost. So each machine has uh, 16 CPU cost. So we compare our three algorithms. So system A and system B are also primary server, but it's developed by some by companies not disclosed yet. And this is the open source one. The system A runs LBFPS LBF method. So it's, it's like gradient descent, but you use a gradient to approximate the setting the hazy matrix. So this is a very famous and stable algorithm. You use a sequential consistent model that is bridge this equation only up start this iteration after the previous one has been finished. This is the strongest uh, consistent model. You use, we have been spent two years on this algorithm. You have about 10,000 of lines of code. And this is system B. Use the very similar algorithm, the broad body descent we have been discussed previously. And so the, the consistent model is sequential. On this time is year weight. The previous iterate block has been updated and the thing has been come back and start the next things. This is because you have a lot of things and so this is much complex than the previous system. You spend more nuts on code. And this is on the open source, the primary server. Use the same algorithms, but use a different kind of data consistent model. Use a one year delay, that is, you can allow different block, several block to be updated at the same time, and you allow, you can do some field work. And because back then have been, uh, you just use the interface of this one, so you can have her. Because all these things are space, sparse nature, you the records, you can generate some math, that might have my code, so that the number of code is quite small. But only Three hundred months of code. This is the readout time versus object value. That means, given given the time, we count we compute the object function uh, of the, the the value of the object function. The smaller the better. So this is this means how much fast. So first, look at the system A. So the object just algorithm. So just like generate LPF, LPFPS method, you convert slowly at the beginning, but you can convert very fast at the end. But this is not we want because given the same object function, we spend several years, four hours to get it. The next is a sequential block body descent. Comparing to the LPFPS one, you convert very fast, and you can get a good performance after half of the time. And the, the red lines, the same algorithms, but using a relaxed uh, consistent model, that is, you parallelize the CPU and the network. So even that, maybe you have the same conversion rate, but you can save, you can reduce the network time. And for, before give how the times spent on each part, I first give you a work because we use a KPD field here that is if the model is sparse and then we can really build out a lot of features that is how many percent of network batteries we have been uh, saved so once the once the uh, times go to the, the final and the, the percent of the data we feel is close to 97% so for, for this application, the master slash file shows how the time is composed for the different system. This is the time spent for a working machine. The red is how the time percent of time spending on the on local computation. This is the time of waiting. So for the LPFGS one, you technically run 100 iterations. So you have a 100 
varies between all these machines and give about 30% of times on waiting the network. But this time was much larger for the block body descent because each time you need to update only small, small block and for each pass of data you may do about hundreds of blocks so you have a hundreds of global waiting for the whole system. So this goes to much larger, more than 50%. But if there are now some asynchronous here, if there are now data do not consistency, you can significantly reduce the number of waiting time. But you pay a cost here because nothing is the local computation. This is this value slightly increased because the data is not so inconsistent and you slow down the conversion rate. But even that you give a huge gain on the network. So the slider increase of the computation parts is a worse. And you can reduce the total time of the only half of it. The next application is LDA. So talk model. So what we do is that we model the user interest but based on the URL directory. We use up to five billion users and we observe which user click which URL. And we can, it's an unsupervised method, so it's like a work like a cluster. And we want to group the users onto about 1,000 topics. And because it's much smaller, much advanced than the standard media classification, so we use more, more machines, so about 6,000 machines. If you have each machine, you have 10 calls. Here's the conversion rate. It's a lot like good, the max, the max the better, the larger the better. So here's two lines. One that you, you use only 1,000 machines. You get the, this one by about an hour. And if you increase the number of 6,000 6, machines, okay, you can almost get four times speed up of this kind of application. And because small data, you can have a good scalability if you have tens of machines. If you, if you get still this kind of speed up for a very large number of machines, it's generally it's not as much as other than a small machine. Thank you. 
which uh, you can uh, for the reactivation. So, for example, the online advertising, we generate some, we generate some data, display some app, we collect this app, and run some offline algorithm to modify the model, and this model goes online. So, it's a loop. I didn't show that picture, but it's a loop. So, in overall, it's a, it's a, it's online updating. So, it's a streaming system. This is long as a small component on the gen how to modify the, the general system. And yeah, the server node that the model on the, on the server node. So um, uh, I show you a picture.
less number of features. Okay. Yeah, we might some user different type of way to do things. So I think one could also do not consider the feature code to so so large scale. Fine, so okay. It's not possible. 